So now that we know about some of the complicating factors, or at least the simple ones like declination and ecliptical orbits that affect tides, what do tides actually look like in the ocean? Well, they have extremely long wavelengths, uh, 12,000 miles or 2,000 kilometers, basically half the Earth. Now, it, tides are shallow water waves because the depth of the ocean is um, too small, right? And shallow water waves have depths that are less than 1 20th the wavelength. Um, now, if they were deep water waves, they would travel incredibly fast, actually faster than tsunamis, and this makes sense because the wavelength is so long. A thousand miles an hour or 1,600 kilometers an hour. This number, 1,600 kilometers per hour, I want you to keep in your head for a second. But the depth would have to be um, 22 kilometers, and the ocean has a depth of about 3.7 kilometers, so the depth is not even close um, to deep enough. So what happens is the waves interact with the bottom, and it slows the wave down. So instead of moving... At the 1,600 kilometers per hour, it moves about 700 kilometers per hour. That's still pretty fast, it's faster than planes fly. Now notice the Earth rotates at around 1,600 kilometers per hour, a little slower at the tropics. This is because that the the really the Earth should be rotating under the wave and the wave should stay in the same place. But due to friction and a sloshing effect and the continents and all the things interacting with that wave, the tides don't keep up. And what this means is that in some places the tide moves faster than other, and when you have a wave that moves faster on one side than it does at the other, you'll remember from wave refraction, it begins to rotate. Um, in water, in typical wind waves, we see this as that the waves appear to bend towards shore. When we're dealing with the ocean, it appears that they're rotating in cells, and this becomes really important. So there's a, a picture in the book, um, and I wish I knew which number it was, it's like 9, 12 or something. And this picture confuses a lot of people. And what we have are, um, we can see a couple of things here going on. Um, first, you can see what we call co-tidal lines. And what these lines refer to is what how far after Greenwich noon time high tide hits. And we get these centers. So I'll draw them in blue, in green rather. We have a center right there. That center is called an amphidromic point, and that's the point at which, in the northern Atlantic Ocean, the tide rotates around, and it actually rotates in this direction. Um, we'll back up out of that. And what that means is, um, at this point, we have high tide. Two hours later, it's rotated to here. Four hours later, it's rotated to here. Six, eight, and so on. It rotates around. At the at the um, amphidromic point, you see, oh, that's a little off center, you see no tide. Um, the, the tide doesn't appear to go past there, it's rotating around. And when we take into account these co-tidal lines and these amphidromic points, we get a more realistic pattern of tides in the ocean. And you can see that, you know, that I like the North Atlantic one because it's a nice simple gyre, but you can actually see it um, works with another amphidromic point uh, right there, kind of centered around Iceland and it rotates around. There's even little tiny ones in there in the North Sea. And we get a lot of different um, rotations. These are not perfect, but they're a better way to imagine the tides. So what you need to know is what the lines are, the co-tidal lines and the amphidromic point. And just to reiterate, the amphidromic point is the point at which the tide rotates around so it has no tidal um, difference. It doesn't go up or down. And the lines represent the, the wave crest of the tide rotating around that point. And all along that line, every place that falls along that line has high tide at approximately the same time. Other factors um, that affect our, our measuring tides in a real way. We have the effect of the continents. Now, the, in a perfect world, there would be no continents. I guess that's not a perfect world, but in a perfect tidal world. And we would get these waves that rotate all the way around. But the continents themselves interrupt the moving of the tidal bulge. The tidal wave sort of hits it. We get some reflection where the wave bounces back. Um, and what ends up happening is we sort of get these standing waves that move back and forth across the ocean basins. And the shape of the continents themselves also affect when high tide reaches them, um, if they have points, if they have bays, things like that. And the tides themselves um, can lead to internal waves because of this wave reflection hitting um, rough bottom topography. We get some weird waves created in Hawaii because as the tide moves um, back from um, Asia back towards Hawaii, it interacts with some of the topography and creates some issues. And as I've stated before, there's 400 plus factors that affect tides. So there are two tidal methods you need to know, um, and they're equilibrium tide method 
and what equilibrium tide method is. Uh, it's also called static tides. And the key here is that there are no continents and it's just ocean. And this um, equilibrium tide method um, explains most of the tides we see. Um, and in, in the equilibrium tide method, we would include um, tide generating force, declination, um, the effect of the ecliptics, apogee, perigee, aphelion, perihelion, and so on. The dynamic tide method is one that we actually use. It includes the continents and the ocean floor, and it's a better predictor. Um, there's 62 factors altogether included in dynamic tide method. It's the one that's used for predicting most tides, and it accounts for 70% of the tidal range. Now remember, we said there's over 400 factors. So those other 100, 360, 340 some odd um, factors account for 30% or so of tidal range. We're actually going to stop there. This one's fairly short. Uh, we'll get into tidal patterns um, on the next one.